Um, second time, it's always a charm. Good afternoon, Virginians, friends, and guests who are joining us by Zoom. Welcome to the October 7th meeting of the Rotary Club of Louisville. I'm Jean West, owner of Faces West Productions and president of the club. To provide our invocation today is Deline Taylor, Rotarian, and chair of the Speakers Committee. Thank you. Dear God, thank you for the educational opportunities that we have in America and for the teachers, administrators, coaches, and mentors who invest their lives in shaping the minds and hearts of our future leaders with not only knowledge, but integrity, resourcefulness, and agility. Guide students to discover and develop their unique gifts and talents to use for good, to excel in their strengths, persevere through weaknesses, and remain resilient in the face of ongoing uncertainty in our world. Protect their hearts, minds, and bodies. Inspire us to do all that we can to help them succeed. Bless our speaker and our food and fellowship today. We ask these things with humble and grateful hearts. Thank you, Damien. And now to provide the pledge and formal witness to Stan Hartridge, Principal at Guthrie Lakes Public Relations. Thank you, Jean. Uh, first, join me for the pledge. Pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now for the four way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Thank you, Dan. You may be seated, Rotarians. It is always our pleasure to welcome the guests to our club. I would like to first introduce my guests. First, Yvette Gentry, you stand. Yvette Gentry, former interim police chief and uh, now director of Black Men's Male Achievement at Metro United Way. Thank you, Yvette. Very instrumental in some of our programs that we are uh, engaged in now. So we want to thank you that for that. Robert Chatham, who is a former, where are you, Robert? There you are. Remember Robert? He's back. He's visiting. President of the Sun, Rafael, California, Rotary this year. And Robert, come on up here and get a play. How about that? Did you bring a flag for us? I will give you one. I will send it. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to be here. Right here. Right here. And we also have Tom Harris, who is here as Vice President of Community Relations at the University of Kentucky. Welcome, Tom. <laughs> Take your name first, introduce your guest, and yes, please stand when you are introduced. Cajun Queen, I mean President Jean. <laughs> Walking on President elect of the club. I have uh, two of my buddies that are here with me today golfing buddies, fishing buddies, drinking buddies, but they're members of the Big Blue Nation. Bruce Miller on my right here is Vice President of Business Development with Prime West Health. And then on my left is Mark Downer. And Mark is, uh, has a Landstar trucking company, but he's also an author. So he's written a book called The Cetera Doctor by Mark Downer. He's a big blue UK uh, fan and graduate. So Dr. Capilouto, I have this for you. <laughs> President West, I'm Landon, USI Insurance Services, also chair of the Greater Louisville UK Alumni Association. Um, I've got three guests here with me today, Sherry Moe, Jim Stucker, and Dan Jacobs, also involved with the UK Alumni Association, along with a couple other members of us here with us today. President Gene, Lewis Speaker with Citizen Union Bank. Um, my guest today is Laura Carr with the Greater Wolfman Medical Society. She's back here. She's a business uh, relationship specialist. 
Uh, President G. Doug James, Advertising Director of Business First, and I brought someone who may actually fill your email box up with regular emails. Lisa Benson, our President, Publisher of Business First. President Gene Luke Schmidt, President of L.B. Schmidt & Associates, uh, boy still a horse from the Kentucky, Florida game. Uh, go Cats. Very, very happy to have as my guest today, William Summers V. Uh, William is the Senior Vice President, Chief Community Development Officer at Republic Bank. Welcome. President Gene, it's uh, Steve Eggers. Um, if you want to remember, as Service Project Chair, I uh, brought two guests today. Um, Stan, Bob Haberman, managing partner of Kano and Gary Associates, Christopher Fuller, partner of Kano and Gary Associates. I brought them along because they, they're involved with the UK project right now, the College of Design. So, thank you. Hello, Deline Taylor, CPA with TMLO, and I am the chair of the Speakers Committee. Um, I would like to introduce uh, four guests today. I have Sam Overby, who is with Treasury Management at Fifth Third Bank, Jennifer Glazer, who oversees the Silver Creek High School Academy of Finance program, and she will be bringing some of her students um, to a couple of our meetings, so we'll have the tables for them. Uh, make sure you interact with them when they're here. And then Alice Shade who is a um, strategic consultant and entrepreneur in residence at UofL, and joining us shortly, hopefully, he's um, leading another meeting, is Ian McClure with um, the UK Office of Technology. Ah, there he is, just in time, Ian, with the UK Office of Technology Commercialization. So, thank you and welcome. Uh, President Jane Hill of Charities, Kevin Field, is the CEO of the Little Central Community Center and chair of our club's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. I'm pleased to introduce my guest today. She is a entrepreneur, multipreneur, a nation trade view, being the founder of you know, the Marketplace, uh, Manhattan on Broadway, which is a venue on East Broadway. <laughs> Uh, also the founder and CEO of Inspire Network for Women, a business network for women. I'm excited that she's bringing the Millionaire Marketplace to Old Walnut Street on October the 22nd when we will be uh, celebrating our fifth annual Economic Mobility Summit. And I welcome you all to that. Thank you. President Gene, I'm Bob Nesmith, uh, co-owner, soon to be retired from Cutting Down Golf Car. Uh, my guest today is my friend, my neighbor, attorney and former attorney general, and UK alum, Chris Gorman. I also want to point out that I rode the elevator up with our president today. He pointed out she had on LSU colors. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, watch out for the tomatoes. <laughs> Thank you and welcome guests. If you'd like to learn more about our club, please stay after the meeting. We're in what is Rotary session with our heads of Craig Sherman. Where's Craig? Craig, 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 are you here? Well, he'll be here shortly. All right, since you brought them up, we'll trash talk here. <clears throat> President Kathleen Rideau, with all due respect, each week we do a little bit of Cajun culture lessons, okay? So today's is our sports edition. How many times has LSU sent out Mike the Tiger for wins against UK in this century? <laughs> Kentucky, LSU has won six of the past seven times these two have met in the 21st century. Kentucky actually won the last meeting these two teams met in Lexington. Kentucky, the Tigers, 43-37 in an upset for the number of one ranked Tigers in three overtimes in 2007. That was before your time, so I'll, I'll take that. Okay. LSU leads the all-time series record, 40-16-1. The Tigers have won the last two games in the series, including a 41-3 win in the last meeting in the Top Rouge in 2014. 
So this Saturday, all you people wearing blue, it can be crying in here. I'm just, I don't love it anymore. Dr. Eli Capabuto is the 12th president of the University of Kentucky. He previously had been the provost of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. His alma mater, and not far from where he was born, in Montgomery, Alabama. He's also a graduate of the Harvard School of Public Health, among other distinguished higher learning institutes. A dentist by trade who never planned on becoming a university president, he assumed his current position in 2011. Under his leadership, the university has grown from a 2.7 billion to 5.1 billion in total operations and has gained significant momentum in fulfilling its mission of teaching, research, service, and healthcare. UK athletics remains one of the few self sufficient athletics departments in the country, receiving no state or general funds from the university. In a letter to the Board of Trustees, President Capolito proposed giving 10% of his salary for the 2020-2021 academic year to the Employee Assistance Fund set up by UK's Department of Human Resources. The fund was established to help the 1,700 UK employees who were furloughed during the coronavirus pandemic. The president also encouraged others in leadership positions to do the same. In full disclosure, I have the privilege of serving on the University of Kentucky Board of Trustees Healthcare Committee under Dr. Capilouto's uh, leadership, along with my dear friend and colleague, the late great David Hall. It was a pleasure getting to know Dr. Capilouto and his wife, Mary Lynn, also a dentist, while serving, when many times I would hear the president say, the University of Kentucky is also the University for Kentucky. The 2021 academic year is the final year of President Capilino's contract. The Board of Trustees Chair Robert Vance announced in a letter to the campus that President Capilino intends to extend his tenure as president of the Thank you for the kind introduction, generous remarks. Jamie, it is a pleasure to be here and to see so many familiar uh, faces and to share with you a little bit about the University of Kentucky and what the community support makes possible. Every time I attend the Rotary meeting, I did. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago in Bowling Green, I'm always struck by those four questions and the tenets of this club, which are so similar to those of the University of Kentucky. We have the same mission, I think, that we began with over 156 years ago, and that is to advance Kentucky. A healthier, wealthier, and wiser Kentucky is what we work for. And although we had to grapple with the pandemic for the last 18 months, we still want to continue as the University of, for, and with Kentucky, focusing on how we advance the state. So we have been planning for the future. It's rooted in yesteryear, today, and tomorrow. I'd like to offer five principles that are going to guide us as we go forward, and then four numbers that I think capture what we do and what we plan to expect. So what are those five principles we're going to follow as a university? First, inspire ingenuity in every part of our community. We want to be, as it has been written, the problem finders and the problem solvers. We want to do that in our research labs in partnership with community, and certainly in our classrooms so our students can carry that forward. Next, we want to take care of our people. And I'm talking about those people that come to work every day, we work out in all 120 counties, our extension offices. We have to take care of ourselves so we can better take care of Kentucky. Not alone, but as strong partners with those throughout the state. 
We need to continue to put students first in everything we do. That is why we come to the University of Kentucky every day. And when you are a five point one billion dollar enterprise, it is imperative that you measure yourself and keep yourself accountable in terms of trust and transparency. And last, honor that idea that we are quite diverse. We are many people, but we must be one community. And so what are those four numbers I want to talk about? 470 million, 250,000, 30,000, and one. And there's a story behind each one of those numbers. This past year and a half has been unlike any I have experienced in my 40 years of higher education. COVID certainly refined how we look towards the future. We also learned the consequences of being separate than together. And we've opened in what is a sort of new normal. We thought we were completely out of this, but we had to again develop a plan and then work that plan. And again, everybody came together to make this possible. Volunt volunteers, uh, College of Design, Design, and helped produce uh, face uh, protections in there. And then, as we are reassembled on campus this year, we set as a target first 80%, and then 90% of our campus would be vaccinated. Uh, we're at 88% today and climbing. We know that wearing masks and being vaccinated keeps those rates quite low. The report I got today, we've been open for four or five weeks now. We've had people congregate safely. Today is a typical day at the University of Kentucky. Four employees tested positive and only seven students. So seeing us come together, especially in this time of uncertainty, gives me hope, deep body hope, and what we're going to be able to do in the future in serving and advancing Kentucky. So a little bit about inspiring ingenuity and that number $470 million. That is the amount of funds we go out and compete for, usually against the best competition in this country. Those are the external funds we bring into the state of Kentucky to help solve what are seemingly intractable problems. It's up again 9% this year, putting us amongst the top in the country. And more important than what those dollars represent is what we choose to direct our attention and our sources. And for us, we call them our research priority areas, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity, neuroscience, substance use disorder, energy, and commitment to a diverse community. Those are our priorities when it comes to research. Why do we have an advantage? I believe we're one of eight institutions in the country that has this broad array of disciplines from the complete academic health center to engineering, law, social work. You know, we have it on our campus, contiguous campus. The answers to these seemingly intractable problems are found at the intersection of the disciplines today. And we're able to capitalize on that at the University of Kentucky. And we're able to translate those results into community. We want 27 universities in the country that has three federally funded centers and recognized first national cancer institute, a Markey Cancer Center. We have a clinical translational research center uh, that serves Kentucky. And finally, we have the longest uh, funded neuroscience or Alzheimer's uh, grant in the country and our Sanders Brown Center for Aging. Taking care of our people. I like to say a university are really about two things, people and ideas. And one story that I think demonstrates that is how we responded to COVID. In January 2020, just weeks before, vaccines were being delivered to hospitals across the country. Those were one of the few places that could store and have the logistics and we started vaccinating healthcare workers. I talked to Commissioner Stack and I said, if you get us the vaccine, we'll go far beyond that. All our first responders, all our K-12 employees, public or private, anybody who's on a priority list, we will make a commitment to vaccinate. 
And I said, we'll do it quickly. I had no idea how we we're going to do that, but I had confidence in our people. To make a long story short, 250,000 vaccines were administered at Kroger Field, sometimes 4,000 a day. I think it was the most successful, efficient, and customer friendly mass vaccination center in the country. And it took so many people to make that happen. From our police, our emergency operations center, and all those volunteers I mentioned before. We were able to do that because it is within our hearts and soul. We also that took that mobile clinics out to those underserved communities. Putting students first. We know that our students are going to be that next generation of leaders, scholars, workers, and public servants. We are fortunate to have 2,700 students from Jefferson County. And we've delivered on our results. This $2.8 billion of investment in our campus was not for the bricks and more. It was to better serve Kentucky. A few numbers I'll share with you. Ten years ago, we graduated some 5,400 students. Annually, we do well over 7,000 now. Our graduation rate is two percentage points. It's gone up 10 percentage points away from that threshold where the top 150 universities in the country deliver on success. And that includes every university out of the 4,500. And that 30,000 number, to me, is an example of our high tech and high touch. When we had to send everybody home in about a three day notice uh, in the face of COVID, our teams came together and called every single student. We even wanted to know how they were doing and how we could better serve them. So this was a massive logistical undertaking, uh, undertaking, but it is about putting students first. And our trust, transparency, and accountability. We are privileged to wear the mantle that bears this state's name. And we have a sense of pride and what the responsibility that comes with that. And we have to work daily daily to make sure that we can ensure a lasting, productive system of partnerships to better serve the state and build on trust. And finally, many people that in one community. Yesterday, I went home for lunch. My wife and I live on campus with two dogs, and as usual, there was a tour group out front. I told them this was the safest 700 acres in Kentucky. Got some 4,000 cameras on our campus to watch what's going on. We've got all these folks vaccinated, taking care of themselves with enormously low rates of infection. But we're also, I think, the most diverse 700 acres in Kentucky. Too. We have students from all 120 counties, all 50 states, and over 100 countries. And that responsibility to live up to that ideal of being many people with different stories, perspectives, and opinions, but one community is one on which the university must dedicate its heart and soul so that this future generation can further reconcile too many things that are dividing us. So that's a little bit about the University of Kentucky. And as I look across this room, I see so many people who I've had the pleasure of meeting over the last 10 years. And it has taken everybody to continue our ascent at the University of Kentucky. And I want to thank you all. Am I on? <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you again. Um, oh, I have to sing. <laughs> do, do you sing? Not uh, well. Okay. Uh, you were talking about the uh, areas of focus in your healthcare. We actually we have a, a very strong global connection with the Bart City Brown uh, Center for Diabetes. Research with the focus on the 
that we need to chill with. Can you talk about that a little bit? And that, by the way, is the party, the derby party that was here at the Marks at Brown Home, which raises, oh my, how many, how many buildings has she raised for you kids so far? A bunch. Uh, a bunch. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, obesity and associated diseases that I mentioned were made a challenge. My predecessor, Dr. Todd, looked at Bell's list one day and said we were in the wrong place on too many lists, and he called it the Kentucky Islands. Well, our responsibility is to continue to work to overcome those. And we have to do that certainly in the laboratory, but out and in community as well. Um, you also talked about your uh, aging research for the Claudia Fender Center for Aging. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? But I years ago they were doing a nice, a nice study, which was uh, state of the art research and, and actually analyzing the brains of nuns who passed away to try to find some answers to Alzheimer's. So I believe. We're the largest bio bank of, of brains in the country. And this has been going on for decades. And we're able, as science develops, to go back and look at these tissues and hopefully unlock the mysteries of what has eluded us thus far in memory disorders. So it's an incredible group. And uh, we just got renewal of our center funding and go up against the steepest competition. You have to have the very best scientists, certainly more and more universities to be for these dollars. So again, it's something we build upon. I tell people that our work that we get to move forward, we always have to do it with gratitude for those who came before us. And certainly the case with that. Can you talk about your campus? I mean, you have, I believe, the largest classroom building in the state of Kentucky on your campus. I don't know, but I sound <laughs> good to me. Your science and research chemistry yeah, building, I'm told. The uh, uh, Jacobs Academic Science Building. That's correct. Probably it. And uh, what I particularly like about that building yeah. is that was part of the renewal of our campus. We had to go to the uh, general assembly and the governor to get support for uh, bond issuance. Uh, previous place, that decision could be made in the board of trustees level. So it was great. They opened up the budget in a uh, non budget year, which is harder to in Kentucky. And we had three projects. The Gatton College of Business and Economics, $65 million. We said we would raise all the money. The second um, project was not in order. They're all together. Is a renewal of what was then Commonwealth Stadium, now Kroger Field. We do just like in anything you do, you have to have infrastructure and talent. And the third was a $120 million academic summer. Uniquely, two thirds of that was paid for by the UK athletics. So they hold the debt service for that uh, building. And we're Quite proud of that, plus a couple of million dollars for general scholarships they contribute every year. No student fees go uh, to athletics. They pay every nickel of their overhead. They even pay a tax to you know, our finance and accounting offices for the services they provide. And they're responsible for uh, the fiscal plans, all the stadiums and rings and so forth. So it's been a great partnership. When we came to the state with those three, projects um and we see no overwhelming support i think help general simply gain confidence in, in what we were able to deliver and make possible what is now 2.8 billion dollars in construction and i think only 200 million of that has come to state dollars the rest um we've done our own and the percentage of our revenue that we spend on debt is smaller than it was 10 years ago. So we've done this quite prudently. And if you get a chance to visit the campus, that building really is extraordinary. Um, 
which time. Or Terry, did you think again that you went to the mic to ask questions? Can you talk about your response to uh, the COVID crisis? You guys actually don't, you have a field hospital at one point, right? Just prepare it. Early on, when the modeling showed that we were going to be overwhelmed, turned out not to be the case, uh, we stood up a field hospital to get over 400 people if necessary. Did that in about a week and a half. To, again, incredible uh, logistics and support that had to be coordinated. And again, um, when it comes to uh, delivering vaccines, we require weekly testing if you're not vaccinated. Uh, we work with our elected uh, representatives from the staff and uh, faculty and SGA. The consequences if one does not comply. And uh, those are the remaining challenges, but I'm pleased. Uh, I think our faculty have hit uh, 93, 94%, uh, staff almost 91%, students uh, 86%, and it moves daily. One of the things we tossed in is you're a student, and you can show up where you're testing. You can't attend our lecture. So <laughs> good thing we had a win. We, we had an uptick and, and students that wanted to comply. So that was good. <laughs> also, uh, yeah, President Kelly, this year and a half has been a year, a lot of term on changes, etc. And we read, I read with uh, interest, uh through your journal had an article in your new hire, the diversity uh, chief. Patrice Albert, who happens to be near my hometown, and I'm hoping that she's been too. Anyway, uh, can you talk a little bit about that and, and, and her hire? Sure. Patrice Albert, uh, when I first met her, uh, she was the vice president for diversity and human resources at the uh, NCAA. And uh, she was extraordinary uh, in that role before she had been the vice president for diversity and inclusion at the University of Minnesota. She's a, a temporary uh, leader, a sought after consultant. And again, uh, I feel most fortunate that we were able to attract her to the University of Kentucky. I do believe that um, good people, good talent, good gaps, talent. So. My name is Roland Vines. Um, I was wondering, in light of the uh, recent changes in athletics, where the athletes are allowed to sell their injury, and then behind that, though, it's probably some of the more dramatic changes. It's uh, speculating that the National Labor Relations Board is going to rule that athletes are employees of the university. What kind of impact do you think that's going to have on this university? I, uh, the questions about some of the court decisions and, and changes really at the state level and name, image, and likeness, uh, I do believe these are consequential. And uh, certainly if you have a deep interest, you can read Justice Kavanaugh's uh, opinion in the Alston case that uh, ruled that the NCAA could not restrict up to the Level of $5,809 payment of quote academic incentives to student athletes. South Asian Conference wants to bring light when the court case came forward. Uh, we passed a conference rule that says each university can come up with their own standards and who they want to include in terms of that payment of $5,809. So you're going to start seeing that, I'm certain, in the next few weeks around the country. And who will it be extended to? The court case was only about men's and women's basketball and football. So everyone, certainly in respect to Todd Lyme and doing the fair thing, I predict would extend uh, to other sports. Then the question is, do you give that to walk -up? So that's just an example of the dominoes that fall as a result of some of these decisions. And the name, image, likeness, which we support, it's, um, we're, we're gonna have to see. You can, those of us that have been around it long enough can remember 
why all these regulations came into effect in the first place, and they were because of abuse. And we're and the NCAA and others trying to keep a level playing field in, front of in terms of competition. So now it's a more of a market driven, and and will that market be um, perfect, fair, and and uh, that's the way to see. But there's going to be a lot more. And you were president of the SEC, right? And now what? Uh, I did it for a couple of years. And I like to tell people uh, I was just the last man standing. You know, <laughs> and, uh, like I ran for office. You know, they, they looked around, and, and, uh, and I was second in seniority. But I was second in seniority after five years. You know, the precarious job. It was my turn. <laughs> Dr. Capilouto, thank you for coming and speaking with us today. We all look forward to you. This is one of the bigger crowds we've had in a long, long time. Thank you for that. A couple of questions. One, I want you to think about this in just a second. It's a softball. I'm telling you that straight up. So what's a question you would like somebody to ask that they never do? So that was the softball. And then the, the other one is, so you went to Bowling Green, but when you go to Wool, Kentucky, what is a question that people out in the state want to ask you that people in Wool would not? Or didn't. Well, well, uh, who knows? President elect, by the way. He'll be asking you these same questions next year. <laughs> <laughs> so I will tell you, even if you don't ask me the right question, I'm going to give you an answer. <laughs> I learned that when I first got here, right? And that's a function for this guy here. Uh, and uh, but there, there are a lot of similarities in the question. It humbles you. When I got here, Jim Stucker and all those who were part of that search committee and board of trustees, people said things to me uh, like, uh, you don't understand how important this position is. Uh, uh, the University of Kentucky is the strongest uh, force for progress and change in Kentucky. You need to understand that. And, you know, I trusted what they had to say. But when you get in this position and you realize after 156 years, what kind of expectations have been built and how we've delivered, sometimes we fall short, but can you go around and say, my first two weeks here, you know, I relived this story with the state senator. I was in Eastern Kentucky, went to lunch, and the uh, senator said, um, my, my child is the valedictorian of her class. I said, that is outstanding. And she said, but you don't understand, my child is going to have to take her to your back in college. And what is the University of Kentucky going to do about it? And you know, my answer in my mind was, gee, we we have a college of education, we're not the department of education. But uh, I got on the phone on the way home and found out we tried to make a difference in those kinds of things. I am most proud without any state support, we didn't request any, we didn't get it. We opened up two four-year medical campuses in Northern Kentucky and Western Kentucky. I visited in Bowling Green, that campus, and I met Tom Harris, who's here with me. We walked through and talked to those students. What we said we were going to do is locally recruit, locally educate, and they, they would stay there to serve their community. So we met mostly the senior class, and that expectation is being met. Those kids are going to practice in those communities where they grew up. And the science shows that that's, you know, how you solve a manpower issue. And, uh, you know, another example of how we got creative and active on it. And whenever I tell people things like that, those things started before me. Those ideas, you know, there are lots of people in the past that should always remember. 
Dr. Capilouto, uh, uh, delighted to have you here today. Thank you so much for coming up. Fred Callen, and I remember which, uh, before you came here, I'm sure you're well aware of this, I'm sure everybody in this room remembers well the effort that was made some 20 or so years ago to uh, transform higher education in Kentucky, particularly uh, among other things, to establish the so called Bucks for Brains program to attract top academic talent from across the United States to come to Kentucky. So my question is, I don't know if anything's left of that at this point, but what can you do, or what can the University of Kentucky do, and what are some of your challenges in enhancing the reputation of the university by attracting absolutely top talent uh, across the United States? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I tell people when a recruiter called me about the University of Kentucky, I wasn't really looking for a job, maybe ready for a challenge. Uh, I got some calls, but when I got a call about the University of Kentucky, two things came to my mind. I heard Lee Todd present at a higher education meeting on the top 20 business plan. I was impressed with it, him, and remembered it. And the second thing, in trade organization, publications I read about Bucks for Brains. Now, there's two things in the back of my mind. So those things matter. Uh, our Council of Presidents met yesterday, who's the president in Kentucky, um, putting together funding priorities. The first, I think we all agree to, most of us, was performance funding. And that was passed by the legislature three years ago focuses largely on undergraduate education because that's what we all do. We have to do quite well in that funding formula and 11 metrics. We either hit 11 out of 11 or 10 out of 11 every year. I think the next closest university may hit five of them. So we, we are striving to meet Kentucky's expectations when it comes to that. Uh, but also within that budget would be uh, additional uh, bucks for brains money largely going to the University of Kentucky and the University of Louisville. So I hope we do continue that. It does help attract talent. Cliff Elgin, kind of a follow-up question. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, partnerships and research and academics with, within the universities in the state? Sure. So I'm glad Ian McClure is here today uh, because he's been uh, enormously successful and leading our commercialization uh, initiatives and doing so in partnership with state cabinet offices. And it's hard for a university to set up these kinds of offices, you know, patent reviews and turning the discovery into something that, uh, and then nurturing it so it becomes a marketable product. I mean, there are more failures than successes. And, uh, anyway, we serve uh, the universities throughout the state now, partnership, thanks to Ian. And one example of something we're working on now, Ian has taken a tremendously uh, important role, along with Vice President for Research, Dr. Cassis, and her counterpart at the University of Louisville. Uh, Congress is moving forward with something called the Endless Frontiers Act. Um, Many people have recognized today that we need to be stronger competitors in the international sphere, recognizing the footprint China has in uh, discovery and commercialization now. Um, so the way this, this funding, we hopefully will be set up, it's going to be important to have uh, partnerships and uh, our first call and first meetings were with the University of Louisville. So, we hope coming together with we to do some things in the region, uh, we can be a, a player in that mission. Thank you for being here today, uh, Lewis Seeger. So I'm going to switch gears from academics and athletics to alcoholic veterans. I know that's going to hit a nerve, but how often is that considered? Is there any motivation? What's the barriers to make that happen? Or are you all just flat out for something having those that game? What's the whole plan? Uh, 
Let me uh, say that I'm the reason I'm, I'm thinking. I'm just a point. I'm sorry. I'm just share. Uh, I, I, uh, we have our S60 presidents meeting of uh, Monday in Birmingham. And uh, part of the background materials, there was a table of how many of our 14 universities do serve alcohol. We, we're not the only one that does. It. Um, I think something that starts with our athletic director, Mitch Barnhart, who, um, sure, we question those things and we discuss those matters, um, and uh, have nothing to report on it now. <laughs> <laughs> no, is that a kind of a field tester to see how it goes? Because most people spend top dollar, it gives them the privilege to have whatever they want. <laughs> so how do you differentiate from the two? Well, you're right. <laughs> I mean, in all seriousness, okay, it is not a trivial uh, matter when you start extending this to 60,000 people. And you know, uh, the sobering part is <laughs> three years ago when I went to that hospital after a game, somebody had too much to drink and hit a four or five year old on their way home and attended the funeral of that child. Um, you know, it's a rare event, but you know, let's think about how we do these things. Thank you so much. Back again. Uh, uh, I, 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 I'll be there to ask you questions. Before. Thank you so much. And my best to you, Lance, as well. All right, another hand, please. Now I'd like to invite back to the stage Dan Hartlett, principal at Guthrie Mays Public Relations for today's announcements. Keeping us busy in a good way. So uh, I'll get right to it. Um, let's see here. First of all, you may remember two short weeks ago, our district. Governor Gail Story presented three awards to our Louisville Club, a Club of Distinction Award for 2021, the Best Ongoing International Service Project, and the Best New Community Service Project for 2021. So, congratulations to the entire club. <laughs> who were intimately involved in some of those activities. So that's, that's very cool. Also in late September, this club launched its um, Saving Our Rivers project with a big splash, who wrote that? Uh, on Wave TV, it was a big splash on Wave TV because President Gene, District Governor Gail Story, Ward Wilson of the Kentucky Waterways Alliance, uh, were all on television and then Rotarians and others joined in the great steamboat launch ceremony at the river uh, after an introductory um, for an introduction by President elect Walt Kuno. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, Walt, were you the last name in? I was thinking about <laughs> being elected or however that works. But President Gene opened the celebration uh, ceremony, followed by comments from District Governor Gail Story, Secretary of Tourism Mike Berry was there, and Ward Wilson of uh, Kentucky Waterways. And uh, everybody that was there enjoyed R&B vibes from Studio Code 502 and met the captain of the American Duchess and wished bon voyage to the passengers as they prepared to sail away. So very cool. And then the mayor's office um, took to the podium and announced a proclamation thanking the Rotary and naming September 27th, 2021 as Saving Our Rivers Day. 
So um, a, a true honor directly uh, from the mayor's office, the Metro, uh, to our club. And this entire Saving Our Rivers project is going, uh, going very well. And we're all looking forward to updates from our sister rotary clubs along the Steamboat's voyage. So that takes us to next week, next week's meeting, October 14th, we will host Speaker Butch Mosby, founder and president, um, sponsor for success. His topic is, you'll always need a plan. I was not familiar with uh, Sponsor for Success. I, I was reading about it online this morning. It's really an interesting topic. Um, so we look forward to hearing from Matt. And lunch sounds pretty good on the menu next, next week as well. Primavera tortellini, balsamic <laughs> chicken, garlic bread. Tom, Dr. Pat Ludo, thinking about coming back next week, perhaps. <laughs> uh, so you don't want to miss the speaker or the food next week. Um, also, uh, let's talk about Rotary Day Golf. Rotary Day Golf is back with a new lower price and better format. Uh, so let's make your plans. October 11th is the day. That's Columbus Day. So we will all be meeting at the Santa Maria. <laughs> We're not really meeting at the Santa Maria. We will be meeting at Reynolds Country Club, okay? Um, this is the last week of the event. It is it's coming up quick. So this is the last week. Uh, so for $50, you will receive a buffet lunch that includes a drink, a round of golf, uh, with, a, with a golf cart. Prizes will be awarded in the male and female, men and women divisions, uh, longest drive, longest putt, closest to the pin, and a few other surprises along the way. You can sign up individually. You can sign up uh, as a pair, threesomes, foursomes, uh, and if you haven't already registered, it is coming up. So make sure you, you either call the Rotary office at 589-1800 or email rotary, rotary at rotary um, Now, a very special Kentucky honor flight is scheduled for October 20th. This is the first, maybe the last, or the only uh, 2021 honor flight for Kentucky and Southern Indiana veterans of World War II Korea. In Vietnam. So if you can, you might want to make plans to volunteer and assist this special group and, and, and their families uh, either before or after the trip to Washington, D.C. They're going to visit the various war memorials and Arlington Ceremony, uh, Cemetery. And also um, they'll have lunch there and meet with several elected officials. So they will return later that day about between 9 and 10 o'clock in the evening. And uh, it'll be a memorable day for the veterans, and uh, maybe some of us can plan to join the crowd and, and cheer and greet them when they return. Every veteran that we all know deserves our gratitude and thanks and for the service. So our presence there would be pretty cool. Um, let's see, we also appreciate uh, everyone registering your meeting attendance a week in advance. So as a reminder, just use the link that's provided on the RSVP, uh, in the RSVP email, or you can uh, use the QR code that uh, is on your table right now before you leave. And keep in mind, as always, the reservations close by four o'clock or at four o'clock tomorrow, that's Friday, tomorrow, and this is the deadline restaurant requires. So please respond certainly by tomorrow in the meeting, of course, it's uh, available on Zoom as well. And now it's time to wish some happy birthdays to some Rotarians coming up this week. And um, we've got a lot of them. Um, listen, today is October 7th. So October 7th today is the birthday for Roger Dalton, Sam Graber, and Julie Johnson. Um, October 9th is Carol Butler and David Dunn. Ben Richmond, his birthday is October 10. October 11th. It was a busy day back then. Uh, we, we, had, we had Fred Tower, we had Dave Luckett, Mark Holman, and John Morse. Um, October 12th is uh, Lee Gilliam and uh, Mark Morris. Uh, so for all of you that are here, happy birthday to you. And if you're not here, shame on you. Uh, that takes care of this. And President Gene, the floor is, it, is yours again. Or yourself. Because <clears throat> we have a special announcement today. Thank you. 
came here for it, uh, celebrating an amazing 46 years. We would like to congratulate Jack R. Guthrie for his service and dedication to our club. Jack. All right. Again, note the big board of Rotarian names, find a name, find a Rotarian, say a word, begin, come to the meeting. And again, our Waters Rotary table is uh, there. He is. There's a handsome guy there, Craig Sherman, if you have any questions. And again, please scan the QR code at your table. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.